From criticizing an entire generation for living in a bubble to his advice on how they can actually enact positive change, here's why Jordan Peterson tells millennials they can't change the world. The famed psychologist often comes under fire for his controversial views, especially when he criticizes millennials for living in a bubble. Simply put, Peterson's not a big fan of safe spaces, and he definitely doesn't want them in universities. In his opinion, universities are marketplaces for ideas, and as a free speech absolutist, he feels like every viewpoint, no matter how extreme, needs to be engaged with. But despite that, he sees most universities these days as being hostile to certain ideas. You could argue that some ideas have no place in the modern world, like racist, sexist, or homophobic views. Is Peterson just arguing that we should let terrible people do what they want? Not quite. You see, Peterson outlines two modern approaches to the concept of truth. On the one hand, you have what he calls the Marxist perspective, which basically prioritizes social justice and dismantling seemingly harmful institutions and bases its truth on historical oppression of some kind. Do you want to abolish the patriarchy? Or tear down capitalism, perhaps? That's what Jordan would call cultural Marxism. And needless to say, he doesn't like it very much. He said that it makes people adopt a victim mindset, pinning the blame on others for every wrong they experience instead of recognizing where they might be at fault. His preferred approach lies on the other end of the spectrum, and it's based on the work of English philosopher John Stuart Mill. In a nutshell, Mill says that you can't form an opinion if you don't know what the other side believes. If you can't argue with people you disagree with, or even know what their beliefs are. You have no moral authority to say that your worldview is correct. Peterson recognizes that young people go through a so-called messianic stage, which is just a fancy way of saying they want to change the world. But the thing is, you can't change things if you're unwilling to accept multiple viewpoints, or at the very least recognize that they exist. Instead of tearing apart the fabric of society, you need to preserve it as much as you can and update it with every new piece of knowledge humanity gains. He says that truth is a process, and in order to discover the truth, people need to engage with each other and actively challenge their biases until we all eventually become smarter. Jordan's main argument is that woke culture doesn't allow for this. Instead of lively debate, millennials just shout down anyone they don't agree with, and he's afraid of what this might lead to. Honestly? I get where he's coming from, because if we become hostile to different ideas, that can only lead to intolerance, which is pretty ironic, considering that millennials tend to think they're the most tolerant generation ever. Censorship has become a big deal nowadays, and we've all seen people getting dogpiled for saying the wrong thing on social media. Just take James Gunn, for example. The guy got fired for inappropriate jokes he made years ago even though everyone who'd worked with him said that they don't represent who he is. So, how did things get this bad? Well, Jordan pins the blame on the changing family dynamic. People are having children later than ever these days, and they usually stop at one or two. That's a massive change to how things were a century ago. Back then, if you wanted a family, you had to start young, and you'd have at least six or seven children, because you knew that some of them wouldn't survive. This meant that people had kids when they were still pretty immature, so they had to learn and explore the right parenting methods and take a few risks along the way. The modern millennials' upbringing couldn't be more different. They got way more attention as they grew up, and since their parents were a lot older on average, they were much more averse to risk. Instead, they wanted to preserve the parental relationship for as long as possible. Having fewer kids makes it easier to spoil and coddle them, and children don't have to raise each other and compete with one another like they used to. The result? An entire generation of people who don't know how to take no for an answer. This is just Jordan's view, by the way. I'm just outlining what the man himself has said, so don't shoot the messenger. I'm saying this because Jordan also blames a major 20th century development for the current state of affairs. The birth control pill. The invention of modern contraception gave women autonomy over their bodies for the first time which I personally think is a good thing, but Jordan has a few issues with it. For starters, it led to smaller families, which, in Jordan's opinion, prevented children from getting accustomed to the real world. When you have a smaller set of kids to raise, there's a much bigger chance of overparenting. It's impossible to do that when you have a half dozen kids running around. So there is some logic in what Jordan's saying here, I guess.
Of course, many would strongly criticize this, and rightly so. Jordan's view is that birth control somehow led to a weaker generation being born. And no matter how much he talks about safe spaces and identity politics, that's a pretty weird belief to hold. But okay, let's just give him the benefit of the doubt. Are there any specific problems that he's pointing to? Yes. Like, for example, the fact that overprotective parents make for unconfident, unprepared children. Just think about it for a second. If you're raised by parents who never let you discover anything independently, if they plan out each minute detail of your life, how are you going to handle anything when you're all grown up? I mean, millennials are moving out much later than previous generations, so something has clearly gone wrong. Because it kind of seems like they can't survive without constant handholding. To be fair, the economy's been in the gutter for a couple of decades, so millennials might be staying with their parents out of necessity rather than immaturity. However, Jordan does make a good point about safe spaces. He says that people being treated for anxiety aren't just kept in a secure environment. Rather, they're gradually exposed to the things that upset them, allowing them to become more resilient in the long run. Say what you will about Jordan Peterson, but he is a psychologist at the end of the day. So this is definitely his area of expertise. Now, whether or not safe spaces should exist is a separate argument, but they're what Peterson usually points to when he says millennials can't change the world. As much as they want to, their desire for safety and reassurance means they're unequipped to bring about change. Or even if they somehow influence the world, their supposedly intolerant approach means that it won't be a positive change. In a lot of interviews, Peterson singles out the many millions killed by Marxist ideology, especially under the brutal regimes of Mao and Stalin. And since what he calls cultural Marxism is in vogue these days, he's worried about what the future holds. So does this mean millennials are doomed to failure? Maybe not, because Jordan has some advice if you want to change the world for the better. First, he acknowledges the inherent tragedy of life and the trauma that this can bring. But he also says that you can't just hide from it. He thinks people should strengthen themselves as individuals and expose themselves to the things that frighten them. The first step to overcoming tyranny and oppression is to find the parts of you that are broken, work tirelessly until you fix them, and be willing to accept the possibility that you might be wrong at certain points. If you don't reconcile the harshness of the world, you'll allow it to warp you and turn you into a resentful, frustrated individual. He uses the example of Pinocchio to summarize his views, telling his followers that they should cut the strings that control them to become fully actualized human beings. Pinocchio's maker, Geppetto, wishes upon a star for his creation to become a real boy, which Peterson calls a profound metaphor. By looking up at the sky, Geppetto is raising himself above the mundane concerns of daily life, surrendering to the authority of the highest possible values, and most importantly, wishing that Pinocchio can become a fully developed individual. We are all Pinocchios, but we should also be our own Geppettos. Another of Peterson's favorite metaphors is that of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, when he tells his followers to avoid finding fault in their brothers, but instead, try to find the faults within themselves. So, does he have a point? Or are these just the ramblings of a grifter? You decide. Either way, from his advice for people who actually want to improve the world, to his criticism about those who spend their lives in a bubble, this was why Jordan Peterson tells millennials they can't change the world.